Wednesday's in the word. Boop, boop. Wednesday's in the word. Boop, boop. Hi. Welcome Hello. back. It's good to have you all with us again. We are without Carolyn this week because Carolyn is picking up her son from college. And so we miss you, Carolyn. But we'll look forward to, I think she's rejoining us next week. I can't remember. Um, anyway, you get Olivia and I uh, this week. And if you remember last week, we ended at verse three in chapter eight. And we kind of ended with the beginning of Saul's um, persecution and the great persecution uh, on the church. And so now we're going to pick up in verse four of chapter eight. And we're just going to do chapter eight. Uh, this week. So, um, and this focuses mostly on Philip and Philip's ministry. Philip was one of the original 12 uh, disciples. So let's start in uh, verse four, and I will read down through uh, verse um, 25, 20, yeah, 25. And then um, we'll talk about that section and then do the remainder of it. Okay. All right. Starting in verse four, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John prayed placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. All right, so we'll talk um, a little bit here first. Um, remember when Jesus, um, before he ascends in uh, to heaven, he tells the disciples, he gives the disciples this great commission. Uh, go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptize, teach. Uh, and in, in Luke, uh, at the end of Luke and in the beginning of Acts in particular, Jesus tells them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So now we're seeing, um, remember last week we saw everybody scattered. And so we're seeing the gospel spread now outside of Judea, which is the region surrounding Jerusalem and it's spreading into Samaria. Samaria is kind of the region that's north of Jerusalem, kind of up to Nazareth or on the Northern uh, border. So the gospel is spreading. Um, and then, um, and there are lots of healings and exorcisms that take place here. And so people are paying attention uh, to all of this going on. And then we get this strange person, Simon the Magician. And um, we're kind of told that Simon had kind of fooled people into believing that he had some sort of divine powers. Now, anybody who knows magicians knows that a lot of it is um, sleight of hand, um, kind of fooling people into seeing what maybe they don't see or not seeing what they should, if that makes any sense. Um, and Simon was really good at this. And so because he was really good at this, then a lot of people think that he has divine powers. But we see that the power of the gospel kind of overshadows this and overcomes this. People, when, when Philip is preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel, people stop um, paying attention so much to Simon and um, they're converted to the Christian faith. And they become followers of Jesus. And we're told, interestingly, in verse 12, it's interesting that they make a note here that both men and women were baptized. Why is this important? Because for Jewish people and the Samaritans were Jews by birth. The, the Samaritans kind of were from the old Northern kingdom. Um, and although the Jews um, and the Samaritans hated each other, um, mostly because the Samaritans had kind of started combining some of the pagan beliefs into their Judaism, they were still followers of the God of Abraham. Um, but the old covenant of Jewish people was signified by circumcision and that would only include males in that covenant. So Luke makes a point of noting here that both men and women are included in this new covenant, that it's not just for the men anymore. The women would receive the benefit of the covenant through the men um, that they were attached to, married or children of, or something like that. So this new covenant then extends to both men and women. And Simon himself becomes a believer and is baptized as well. Then as we move down into kind of verses 14 through 17, we get this kind of a, a weird, um, not weird, but kind of a strange little um, explanation that like the, um, the apostles in Jerusalem get word that the gospel is, is spreading in Samaria. And so they send Peter and John down to kind of see what's going on. Um, and what we find out is that um, the people there had not received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I wanna make it really clear here in Lutheran theology, especially, um, we, we make a clear distinction that um, rebaptism is not something that we do and there, and we don't separate baptism. There's not water baptism and spirit baptism. And I think from looking at some of the commentaries that I was looking at here is that kind of the key phrase here is that um, in verse 16, and the people had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. 
So the thought here is maybe there had not been a Trinitarian baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we baptize now, we baptize not only with water, but we also do the laying on of hands and um, the prayer that occurs for that for the individual who is being baptized. Typically, it's a baby um, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We also understand that the Holy Spirit comes with the word. That's kind of the way the spirit comes. Um, but, but there was some confusion here in this situation. So Peter and John come and lay their hands on them and they're baptized and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's important for us to understand that this isn't a re-baptism. It's just merely kind of a furthering of that sacrament or of that promise and that will make more sense as we go further in this chapter then but what happens when um when that happens is that simon misunderstands the gift simon thinks that this is some sort of like magical power that peter and john have in their hands and so he asked them he's like i'll pay you to have the ability to do this with people, you know, give me this power in my hands, I will pay you. And Peter very quickly condemns that. Uh, and he says, <clears throat> you can't buy this. Um, and shame on you for even thinking that you can buy this gift. And um, we see kind of a difference here. Um, remember Ananias and Sapphira who came and lied um, about the money that they were donating and how they were condemned. Um, <clears throat> this Simon is given an opportunity. Oh, I gotta blow my nose. <clears throat> Simon is given an opportunity uh, to repent and to ask God for forgiveness. I kind of think that Ananias and Sapphira were given that um, opportunity as well especially when Peter challenges them. I think the difference here though, is that um, Simon like literally didn't know. Cause I, I can see why they didn't do like the baptism in the way that all the other disciples were, because I wonder if Philip even knew how to actually administer it or if he was just watching and didn't fully comprehend how it was done and didn't realize that you need to lay hands on people and you need to administer the Holy Spirit to people. So then Simon, like I would probably misunderstand if I'm a, some watching this and if I happen to be like a magician or whatever, right? part of that is like, you, how are you supposed to know that this supernatural, whatever we want to call it, Holy Spirit exists when you've never even seen anything like that before. So I think that's right. the difference is because they knew that he he probably did not know, but they wanted to shame him for assuming because, you know, his profession should be shamed, I guess, um, in the Bible, because <laughs> um, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't trick people. Um, but well, I I, for me, that's the difference. That you know, for the church, this is very early on in the church. And so they're probably still trying to um, kind of work out the kinks, so to speak. Um, you know, as we look back on, on 2000 years of the church, and we understand the process of baptism, and that's all kind of come to be that we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That wasn't maybe, you know, how they all did it right away. And I think this is very new. This is right after the apostles are scattered. And, and so, um, I mean, who knows how this is happening? And, and maybe the spirit was withheld from these pe people just so that Peter and John would go there and see the work that was being done in the sharing of the gospel in Samaria as well. So there's when I don't think a tutorial was given on how to do it either. Exactly. And um, my my commentary mentions the fact that Simon thought of it as um, a power to be used rather than a person. 
right which i thought was interesting because i don't often think of the holy spirit in that way like just the the way it was for, i don't i don't think of it as a person yeah and I a think lot of, of it as a spirit you know yeah and a lot of us forget that the holy spirit is also fully and completely god and is a full complete person of the trinity um with his yep. own his or her own um power and authority and activity and work and gifts and so mm -hmm. yeah you're right i think simon misunderstood that um this was the work of the one of the persons of god of the trinity and it wasn't something that you could buy so i think that's kind of a good lesson um yeah so, so Peter, you know, condemns this lust for power, but then offers him this, this chance for forgiveness and he's given it. Um, he repents, Simon repents and, and then is given the gift of forgiveness. And then kind of at the end of that section, then we're told that Peter and John then travel back to Jerusalem, but they continue also. Uh, to preach the gospel in various areas of spirit of Samaria as they're um, heading back to Jerusalem. So the gospel here now is spreading and uh, expanding. All right, Olivia, will you read um, verse 26 through the end of the chapter, please? Yep. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Dang. Yeah, Philip was a busy guy. Um, so a couple of things here that we um, need to kind of point out. First of all, we need to understand who is this Ethiopian eunuch? Ethiopia um, is where it is present day in Africa, south of Egypt. He was also, we are told, a eunuch, which means he was a castrated male. And they did that a lot of times to um, when they would put these men like in charge of maybe a harem or in trustworthy positions. And we're told that he was in charge of the treasury of um, Candace, who was the queen of Ethiopia. And um, so this, this guy is a high ranking official, but because he is a eunuch and he's Jewish, uh, because we're told that he's coming from worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem. He is essentially unclean. He's outside of, um, because for Jewish people, a, a eunuch would be somebody who would be looked down upon. He was um, a, an unclean person. 
he would have been, um, so when the, when the um, people of Judah were taken off to Babylon, um, a lot of the Jews that were left behind scattered. And some of them went to um, Egypt and even down as far as Ethiopia. So this guy was a Jew from that exile and probably was a maybe third or fourth generation um, Jewish person. Um, and he is, like I said, uh, on his way back from Jerusalem. It's also interesting to note, and our translation that we read from is the NIV. In my um, ESV translation, it makes it a little clearer that he's traveling. Um, in verse 26, when the angel of the Lord says, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Um, it, in my ESV translation, it says to go in the desert region. Um, and he, he heads down towards Gaza. Gaza is the route then, on route from um, Jerusalem to Africa. It runs along the Mediterranean Sea, along the Eastern side. Um, of the Mediterranean Sea. And at that time, it's, and still is, um, largely desert and was pretty much uninhabited, a very barren, desolate wilderness place. And so that's then where um, God tells Philip to go. And as he goes there, he encounters uh, this eunuch. And it is clear that this individual is wealthy because he's in a chariot and also that he's educated because he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. Not everybody had scrolls. So he possesses a scroll that he's reading, which is kind of a big deal. And he's able to read it. Um, so he clearly reads Hebrew and he's reading this and the spirit tells Philip, go stand near this chariot. This is the first kind of little like tutorial we get in how to evangelize. Philip doesn't just go blustering in. Um, the spirit leads him to an opportunity and Philip just listens for a while to determine where he's going to start on this. And so the opportunity is being given here to Philip to learn a little bit about this person, this person who is shunned from society. Um, they're in a lifeless, desert, spiritually dead place. And this guy is reading from Isaiah 53, which is that whole chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 53 is called the suffering servant passage. And I encourage all of you to go and read it because it's very, very clearly about Christ. When Philip hears him reading that, he's reading it out loud. He then asks a question. Do you understand what you're reading? So Philip is kind of, there's an invitation here that's happening here into a conversation. And it's a very kind of non-threatening invitation. Do you understand what you're reading here? Do you understand what this is about? And the eunuch then responds. He was like, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? Which is then the invitation back to Philip. And he invites Philip to come up and sit in the chariot. And Philip then beginning with that passage, explains that and a lot of the other prophecies in the Old Testament, and then talks about Jesus and how Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. So it becomes a wonderful way for Philip to share the gospel, uh, which clearly has an impact on this man. And then I think here is one of the most profound um, 
sentences in this particular chapter when the eunuch says, um, it says, as they traveled along the road, I'm in verse um, 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? So here they are in this desert region uh, and all of a sudden there's water. And the eunuch asks a really important question. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip baptizes him. This now becomes a moment where we realize that no one is left out. No one is outside of the circle anymore. Everyone is welcome to come into the family of Christ through baptism. This eunuch who had probably been shunned had never maybe been able to worship in the main part of the temple because of his condition um, now is invited to fully partake in this Christian community. And that's exactly what they do. Um, I also think it's really interesting that at the beginning of this story, we have desert, we have barrenness, we have, um, it's, it's kind of like spiritually dead. And we end with water, with the water of life and with rebirth. And so it's just kind of lovely bookends. Uh, to this story. And then Philip is sent on his way. He ends up in um, Azotus, I think. And uh, which is farther north. He literally just appeared there. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine being him and like standing there and then what now you're standing somewhere else? Right? <laughs> Time travel or teleportation. Yeah. It literally that that is literally probably the only recorded thing time travel that yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah, that I actually believe in. I know it, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, all of a sudden Philip is gone. But then um, we're kind of told the eunuch um, went on his way rejoicing. Interestingly enough, the Ethiopian Christians trace their Christianity to this man this Ethiopian eunuch. And the yeah. Ethiopian Christian church is quite strong still to this day. It wasn't officially um, recognized by the country um, as an approved, so to speak, religion until probably like the 300s. But um, there became a very strong community of Christians in Ethiopia and that continues to this day. And they all trace their heritage back to this man, to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, in my China. my commentary says it's called the Coptic Christians. Yes, the group is called. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know uh, what Coptic is, but well, it's just uh, yeah. And there are a lot of Coptic uh, Christians in Egypt as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's just a. Um, I don't know if I want to call it a denom. Well, I suppose it is a denomination similar to like Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or yeah. All right, and so then yeah, Philip continues on and uh, ends up in, in at the end of this um, chapter here. We're we're told that he he ends up in Caesarea. Just um, kind of an interesting note because I can't remember if we hear about Philip again. Uh, we might a couple of times in the book of Acts, but Philip ends up then traveling um, into Africa, down further into Africa um, and Egypt, but does most of his ministry in Turkey and Asia Minor. And Philip died uh, as a martyr in Turkey in the year 54 AD, and he was crucified upside down on a cross. Um, so 54, he was one of the earlier, one of the earlier martyrs. So probably about um, 15 years after this event. So not very long. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, so that's chapter eight. Did you have any other comments or things, um, Olivia? No, you pretty much um, hit on points that my commentary pointed okay. at too. So I didn't feel the need to repeat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will say one of the analogies it did make, um, just if people don't really understand, is that um, how Philip says that you have to give your whole heart to Jesus to the Ethiopian. It referenced being like a bee, um, how we're, we shouldn't be a butterfly just wandering over the flowers, how we need to be a bee who dives right into the flower, gets the food and flies out. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I forgot to um, mention that. So if you look, now I don't know what your Bible has, but probably everybody else, if you look at the numbering in your Bible, verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came into some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? All of a sudden, then we jump to verse 38. It goes from 36 to 38. 38 oh. orders to stop the chariot. Verse, verse 37. 30, <laughs> yeah, at verse 37, you just quoted, but verse 37 is not in the original manuscripts. It was added. And it must have been after they started doing the numbering system because chapters and verse numbers weren't added until later also. But oh. here's the deal. Verse 37 was not originally there. And there is some contention that that probably is not part of the original text. Verse 37 reads this way. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So there's some question about whether that was actually in the original text or if it was added at a later date. So everybody's Bibles typically skip. It just 37 does not exist in most Bibles. It goes from 36 to 38. I don't. Ooh, that's tricky. Yeah. That's and you see tricky. that in a few places. So, you know, a lot of the problems we have, um, it, you know, um, parts of, of manuscripts or what we have that are added later or things that are taken out. You see this also in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark typically has like a sh what they call the shorter ending and the longer ending um, because hmm. they believe that the longer ending of Mark was added at a later date that it wasn't actually written by Mark but it was added by somebody um, probably one of Mark's followers or something at a later date just to make it seem more complete or that somehow it got um, lost or destroyed. For me, I would assume that there was dialogue between them before stopping the chariot because he wouldn't just stop the chariot. But yeah. well, I don't, I mean, trying to add in specific dialogue, I think is pointless. I just thought it was interesting. My commentary just wanted me to know and other people to know that you don't just like hover they use the word hover over your bible is you have to dive right in in order to get more understanding so if yeah. you don't understand something you need to read um don't be a butterfly well and i think but i didn't even catch that that's yeah, and i think the other point that's a really good point i think that's kind of the point that's being made here too in philip's encounter with this ethiopian is the Ethiopian is reading scripture, but he doesn't understand what he's reading. And so sometimes we need to have, um, we have to dig further um, so that we can get understanding. And sometimes we do that in groups like we are um, together mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, reading commentaries or things like that, um, because all of that understanding doesn't come to us right away. Another thing it mentioned too that I was going to say earlier um, was that we we can pray to God for an open door, but we also essentially because God told Philip he's like 
stand next to the chariot. But as a human, a regular human like you and me, what I would have done is I would have been like, okay, now what? The point my commentary made was, okay, you have to actually actively look for the open door that you're being given. It isn't going to smack you in the face. Right. And so Philip obviously knew what he was looking for when he was waiting for the Ethiopian to finish. That's I, my commentary says, that's why he phrased his question. Do you understand what you're reading? That was him trying to gauge whether that was the open door. And it was. So I thought that was interesting because we tend to be like, okay, now what? It's like, no, you can't, I can't lead you by the hand. You have to take, you just have to try. Sometimes it'll be a window and you'll be like, cool. And then you keep going and try to look for the open door versus waiting to just for it to smack you in the face. Right. So yeah, good point. And it doesn't have to be um, dramatic either. I mean, you know, Philip just asked the question and maybe that, I mean, it could have been that the eunuch said, yeah, I get it perfectly, you know, and maybe that wasn't the okay. Moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so cause like, God arranges the open doors, but we like, we have to go looking for them too. Right. Yeah, you have to be, you just have to see with eyes, um, you know, being led by the spirit. Yeah. See see the opportunities and take the time. um, Once you see the opportunity, take the time to to listen um, for the leading of, okay, what's the next step? I think we have the tendency to rush today. It's very interesting because the thing I notice is like time doesn't matter to these disciples what what matters is what is being taught if that makes sense yep because i mean god took care of it supernaturally to get philip to where he needed to go but philip wasn't rushing he wasn't worried he wasn't like i gotta get here and i gotta get here and by the by like missing that open door but they they take their time because they want people to learn because it, I think they understood that it's something, it's something, it's hard to comprehend who Jesus actually was because they were, they happened to be in his presence, but how do you, it's going to take time to teach people who Jesus was. And I think we rush that sometimes. Well, and even look at the example of the, of the apostles. I mean, they were with Jesus for three years and they still didn't get it. Yeah. So yeah, it takes time and it takes study and it takes um, you know, just, just learning and being intentional about it, slowing down. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, sometimes we do get in too much of a hurry. And we want people to understand. And it's like, I'm not comprehend. It's like when I used to, my math teacher used to get frustrated because I wasn't understanding what, and they tried to teach me the same thing over and over again for equation. And I wasn't comprehending it. And I'm like, I need this a different way. You need to slow, like you, we just need to slow down and we need to be able to help people comprehend and not do a phrase the same way every single time, because not everyone is different. That's the point that God made. Everyone is made in his image, but they're all, everyone's different. No one learns the same way. We can pick up similar tactics, but no one learns the same way. Yeah. And you will see that, that the apostles are very good at that, that they will just start where people are at. Yeah. Philip starts with this guy because, you know, he starts in Isaiah because this guy's reading Isaiah. We'll see it later. Paul will do that um, also in his ministry and we'll see it later in this book. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this time together and uh, for the ability to learn. And Lord, we ask that you help lead us to those open doors, those opportunities, and open our eyes so that we can recognize them. And then help us slow down, Lord, and just listen for your leading. Help us to ask the right questions and then to share openly the wonderful gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the wonderful news that this gift is for all people. No matter if you've been left out before, we are all welcome now. 
Help us to have a great week, Lord. Help us to do your work and to spread kindness and your love across a world that needs it so badly. We pray your blessing in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Uh, we'll be doing next week, we'll be looking at chapter nine. It's a long chapter uh, and there's a lot in that chapter. And then we will be taking a week off. Uh, the week after Memorial Day, because Olivia and I will be vacationing together in Florida with our family. Yeah, so we will see you back again next week. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful week and that you are abundantly blessed. Bye.